on Skinnerism, a program from the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara. Harvard professor B.F. Skinner is acknowledged America's leading exponent of behavioral psychology. He is also the author of the controversial bestseller, Beyond Freedom and Dignity. In his book, Dr. Skinner described a technique that he calls operant conditioning, and he indicated how its use could radically improve the lot of mankind. He is convinced his ideas show the way to a better life, but many of his readers are sure, on the contrary, that the use of operant conditioning could lead to disaster. The center held a conference to discuss both his theories and their implications with Dr. Skinner. Arnold Toynbee, Max Black, John Platt, Arthur Jensen, and several others wrote essays on themes found in Beyond Freedom and Dignity. The papers collectively formed a background for discussion at the conference. In this program, one of a series recorded during that conference, Dr. Skinner responds to points raised in these papers and clarifies some aspects of his book. Dr. Skinner. What has come to be called the experimental analysis of behavior is a highly advanced science. It is, I believe, as rigorous as any part of biology which deals with the organism as a whole. There are hundreds of laboratories throughout the world, scores of them very well equipped, with complex apparatus, the function of which is to arrange carefully designed environments in which the behavior of organisms is studied. Organisms from a fairly wide range of species are under analysis, including man. The results are highly reproducible from laboratory to laboratory. Now, what this work emphasizes is the relation between an organism and an environment, which is not simply stimulating in the way in which a stimulus elicits a, a reflex. The apparatus in an operant laboratory arranges what we call contingencies of reinforcement, and by that is meant the ways in which certain kinds of consequences are contingent upon behavior in a given setting. These are extremely complicated situations, and if you doubt that, I would like to have you go into an operant laboratory and look into the experimental space and try to figure out what is happening. You cannot make sense of it unless you know something about the log of the experiment, in other words, something about the past history of the organism you're looking at, and by consulting the apparatus, detect the contingencies of reinforcement uh, which prevail. Now, these are, are extremely complicated, and casual observation alone will not allow you to make any sense of what you see. And I submit that when we watch human behavior in the world at large, we have the same problem. We know very little about the histories of the people we're watching, we know very little about the prevailing contingencies. But after one has conducted laboratory research in the field, one is in a better position to make at least some interpretational guesses about the prevailing contingencies and come up with some kind of explanation of, of what is going on. To, to deny the existence of such a science in order to avoid its implications, it seems to me just silly, and that is what some of my critics have done. They, they deny that a science of this sort is possible. But it is in existence and going very well. It is not actuarial. It achieves order in the, in the analysis of the behavior of single organisms, which is a great step forward and also an important one. Now, Equally absurd is to dismiss the technological applications of this science. And I want to go over two or three of those in part to uh, exemplify some of the processes involved and to suggest also the power of the analysis. A good many technological applications are going on in experimental laboratories. For example, in psychology, you can take a relatively simple organism such as a pigeon and get information from it 
which in the case of a human subject, you would say, had to do with his sensations or perceptions. For example, the spectral sensitivity of the pigeon is now known as precisely as that of man. In other words, there are very complicated techniques which can be used to ask a pigeon whether or not he sees a spot of light. And if you change the, the wavelength of the light on that spot, you can determine the precise lowest threshold available to, to the pigeon. And the curves which are derived from such research, uh, they're remarkably similar to human curves. When you think of the fact that birds and mammals uh, parted company many hundreds of millions of years ago, but are equally precise, we, you can develop a psychophysics of lower organisms, and it is being, being done, and it's very successful. In the field of, of psychopharmacology, for example, all major ethical drug houses, as they call themselves, have operant laboratories. They're used to set up reproducible patterns of behavior on which the effects of various drugs can be demonstrated. In neurophysiology, the same situation prevails. If, if the role of the neurologist or the neurophysiologist is to explain behavior, then you need a very precise specification of behavior to see the effect of electrical uh, measures or surgical measures or the perfusion of drugs in parts of the brain and so on. And most laboratories of, of neurophysiology now have operant equipment for just this purpose. The medical uh, aspects of this are also involved at the Harvard Medical School, the Department of Psychiatry has a large operant laboratory which is using these techniques to study the effects of certain schedules of reinforcement on uh, um, blood pressure. You can, you can put the blood pressure of a, of, an, of a primate up very high by putting the primate on certain schedules of reinforcement. And I mean by that simply that the organism, in this case a, a small monkey, is working, uh, doing some task under contingencies of reinforcement which generate a very high degree of compulsive behavior and, and the blood pressure changes are then followed. Well, these are scientific applications, scientific technologies involving behavior, and they are extremely effective and um, give, I think, a, a very convincing picture of the power of the analysis. I will leave for others uh, a more detailed discussion of the kinds of things which are going on, merely mentioning that uh, an important field has been the management of the institutionalized psychotic with very often some result which would be called therapy, the care of retardates, autistic children and other defective human beings, the management of training schools for juvenile delinquents, care of children in the home and in child care centers, the whole question of educational techniques at the lower grade levels in high school, programmed instruction was a direct application of principles derived from uh, operant, uh, the operant analysis, and classroom management, which I believe holds the solution to the, the problems of our city schools um, is something which is just beginning to be investigated, but also shows promise. Incentive systems are being analyzed from this point of view, not only the incentive systems of the, of the worker who is act, working in, let's say, a production line, but the incentive systems which affect management. The, contingencies under which a manager is or is not likely to take up a new idea and back it or, or dismiss it. The whole question of welfare has been re-examined in ways which have suggested to some people that even uh, people in high places are beginning to look at contingencies of reinforcement and, and wondering what is happening to uh, the potential reinforcers which are distributed in the name of, of, of welfare. Now, these are active fields. Uh, they are developing fields. There is not as much done as we should like to see. That is my, that is my complaint, because in each one of those fields, I could show you the kind of opposition to the use of a scientific technology which my book uh, is 
is sketching and, uh, and analyzing. There is clear evidence that we are concerned about the very power which is falling into our hands as a result of these technological applications. The second half of my book is concerned with that. I'm convinced that many of my critics have never got to that, uh, that half because they seem to miss my point entirely about the determination of, of who is to use uh, the power of the technology. Now, there are some issues that have been brought up, and one of them I would like to, uh, to, to deal with. Professor Black seems to feel that I'm inconsistent in using the word control. Uh, it is a strong word, of course, much stronger than influence or modify, even stronger, I think, than manipulate. <coughs> the explanation of my use of the word seems simple enough. What comes out of a laboratory study of behavior is this, that at any given moment, the probability that an organism will engage in a given way is a function of the current setting and of the past history of that organism, including, I hasten to say, his genetic history. Now, once you can establish a functional relation of that kind, then if you can find out something about the setting or the history which is relevant, you can predict the behavior. And if you can alter that setting, or if you're thinking about the future, change the history, then you can control behavior. You can modify a condition and produce a modification in behavior. That is what I mean by control. It does not mean that you always get a response out. The whole thing is probabilistic, and that is a point which is often missed. A measure that you take may not induce the organism to behave in a given way at that moment or even later, but it will make the organism more likely to do so. And if you then add probabilities, you can produce the response which is, is at issue. Many people have, have misunderstood the kind of use that I would like to see made of, of, of this. I don't believe at the moment that anyone is going to sit down and design an entire new culture as a monolithic entity of any kind. Unfortunately, the fact that I've written a utopia suggests that that's the case. But the only kinds of technological changes I hope to see or expect to see are such things as better ways of teaching, better ways, better incentive conditions so that the culture will produce the goods it needs, better entrepreneurship so that new ways will be developed, better scientific practices, better education, and, um, and so on. These are piecemeal rather than package changes, and I think they are all well within reach. Anyone who is expecting some uh, gigantic change is uh, likely to be either disappointed or, uh, or should have his fears uh, resolved. I think nothing of that magnitude is, is possible. Apart from the practical applications uh, in prediction and control, there is something else which I think is extremely important, which has also been misunderstood, and that is the use of what you learn in an experimental science in the mere interpretation of what is going on in the world around you. Physicists do this. They will give you a quick explanation of what happened in the tennis court you can challenge them, you can say you don't know what you're talking about, you don't have the requisite information. Nevertheless, their account is likely to be more correct than that of someone who is not familiar with similar phenomena under the control conditions of the laboratory. My, my book, Verbal Behavior, was entirely an exercise in interpretation. I was inferring in the field of verbal behavior, some of the conditions which had been analyzed with much greater precision in the laboratory. I think that the relations I point out in the field of verbal behavior are more likely to be the correct ones than those introduced by someone who has not had the experience of a laboratory analysis. And my book, Beyond Freedom and Dignity, is another example. It is not science as such. I don't say that it is. It is an effort to analyze what is happening in the struggle for freedom and dignity and in the design of, of cultures in terms of behavioral processes. I insist that it is not metaphysics. 
I am only concerned in my book with observable behaviors, things that people do when they struggle for liberty, things that people do when they give people credit or claim credit or avoid the loss of credit in the field of their worth or, or dignity. But you, you must understand that the book is not science. It is based upon the possibility of a scientific analysis. It uses some of the principles derived from such an analysis, which I develop at the time I'm using them, does not go into the actual practical application. I left out the preface and the afterword. I did not begin with the science, and I did not end with a demonstration of the technology. I'm only concerned with the, with the implications uh, in between. Now, there is just one other thing that I feel we should go into, and that has to do with whether or not mental processes, states of mind, feelings, are indeed causal or whether or not good analysis of contingencies of reinforcement will not take over the role which has in the past always been assigned to these inner events. It's the whole question of the status of the individual as an agent, as an originator, as a creator. Let me go back just for a moment and show you how a, an operant analysis can take a traditional mentalistic concept and give an alternative explanation. I'll take the, the topic of attention. Why does the individual not respond all the time to all the stimuli impinging upon him? Well, it's very easy to say because he acts selectively, as if there were some kind of Maxwell's demon inside, which is closing and opening gates and allowing some stimuli to come in and keeping others out. Now that would work if we could explain the demon, but of course we can't, any, long, any more than we can explain it in, in thermodynamics. The internal gatekeeper is a fiction. We have no information about him. All we know are the essential facts, which are that we respond to some stimuli at a given moment and not to others. Now, how can we handle that with contingencies of reinforcement? Well, let me just describe a single experiment. You have a, a pigeon, I'll fall back on my favorite uh, organism, which can peck at a small disc on the wall of the box in which it's confined, and occasionally when it pecks that disc, it uh, produces food in the food dispenser. The pigeon is hungry. Food is a reinforcer, as we call it, and the pigeon will have a higher probability of pecking the key if food then follows, if the, if the response is, as we say, reinforced. Now, the, the pattern on the key can be changed. The key can be either red or green, and it can have a triangular pattern on it or a square pattern. Now, it is possible by reinforcing only when the pigeon pecks a given set of those properties uh, to reinforce, it is possible to change the probability so that the pigeon will peck some patterns and not others. For example, if you reinforce whenever the pigeon pecks the green key but never red, the pigeon will stop pecking the red key and will peck the green. If you reinforce when the pigeon pecks triangles but not squares, it will peck triangles and will stop pecking <coughs> squares. Or you can cross it up and reinforce green square and red triangle, and it will stop pecking the other two patterns. Now, this is very simple. It's all been, been worked out in great detail. Now suppose, however, that you uh, tend to, to um, weaken these stimuli. You, you wash out the colors by putting white light in slowly, and you slowly put the figures out of focus. Now the pigeon is going to have more and more difficulty and eventually when there is no color there, when the key is white, and when it is out of focus so that you can't distinguish the square from a triangle, it will not be able to form these discriminations. But if you give it two other keys and allow it to improve the color by pecking one key and improve the resolution of the figure by pecking the other, the pigeon will do that. It will keep the color pumped up so that it can use color, provided color is essential. It will keep the form pumped up sharpened if it is essential for a successful response. And if you are reinforcing red square and green triangle, it will keep both pumped up because both are essential. 
In other words, by operating these other two keys, the pigeon maintains a stimulus condition in which it can operate successfully. Now that is, I submit, very much like what we do in observing the properties of stimuli. So I submit that rather than a little Maxwell's demon inside, which allows the, the color to get through when it's essential or allows the form to get through when it's essential, it is the contingencies of reinforcement which determine the behavior. There is a very interesting parallel between Darwinian natural selection and operant conditioning, because they are both fields in which the consequences of something are extraordinarily important and take over the role previously assigned to a creative mind. In the case of Darwin, the creative mind was spelled with a capital M. It was the purpose, the design, which produced the millions of diverse creatures on the surface of the Earth. By appealing to natural selection, you can explain the origination of those diverse forms in terms of random mutations and meaningful contingencies of selection. And I believe that we have now accepted that explanation in exchange for the notion of a prior creator. That is, I think, precisely what is going on in the field of operant behavior. The selective action of contingencies of reinforcement take over the role previously <coughs> assigned to a creative mind. And I think it is rather curious that we have allowed the creative mind with the capital M to go by the board and are fighting so desperately to protect the creative mind with a small m. Now, one reason for that is that we are all convinced that we can see our own mind at work. And that is, that is the issue which a behavioristic analysis has, I think, perfectly resolved but has failed to, to sell to anyone outside the field. Most of us believe that we are aware of the inner mentalistic events which precede action and which give them a very high claim to being causal. For example, if you say you came here today because you felt like coming, most people will accept that as having some explanatory value. Whether you can then explain why you felt like coming is another issue. Did you come because you felt like coming, or did you feel like coming because you were disposed to come? I submit that your feelings about coming here are at best byproducts of the real reasons why you came, which lie in your personal histories, your genetic endowment, and so on, and are not themselves the causes of the behavior of coming here. And this, I think, is true of states of mind. When you say you said something in order to express an idea and you got the idea first, I doubt very much whether that's the order of events. I think you, you say ideas occur to you. You don't produce them, they occur to you. As we say, behavior occurred. You have behavior, you have ideas. These are things that come to you, but where do they come from? We'd love to feel that we are in control that we can produce these ideas at will, that we can reject them and so on. But actually they can eventually be traced to circumstances in the past history of the individual. And it is well to consider whether there is any causal status or whether we have not all along been misled by this curious information we have about our own bodies. Now, I've been very much concerned with how one observes one's own body. How do you learn that you have feelings how, or that you have states of mind or that you have intentions or purposes and so on? The issue here, I think, is very close to the old philosophical notion that nothing is different until it makes a difference. Now, when you turn a handspring, you respond to various stimuli coming from your own body, and you wouldn't turn a handspring successfully if you couldn't do that. But you don't know those stimuli in the sense in which we're discussing knowledge here you simply respond to them. The kind of knowing that goes on is a function of other different kinds of contingencies. I can teach a child to know his colors by reinforcing him with colors in front of him, presuming he's not colorblind. I show him red and he says green, I say no. If he says red, I say yes. And eventually he can distinguish a great many colors 
And it isn't just the practical response of picking a red apple instead of a green one. It is the kind of, of abstract knowledge which is called knowing that this is red or knowing what red is. But when it comes to internal states, the verbal community has no opportunity to do this. It doesn't know about these states except through rather indirect inferences. So that when it comes to teach the child the difference between diffidence and embarrassment, for example, it can't follow the same practice. It can't say, now you see, this is diffidence, or what is this? And the child says embarrassment, you say, no, that's diffidence. But you haven't the ability to produce these conditions, hence you cannot set up a precise discriminative repertoire with respect to states of, of the private world inside the skin. I think the, the conclusion one must come to is that it is at least a reasonable interpretation to suppose that the things we see when we look at our own bodies are not the causes of what we do. They're in the right temporal order very often, but they themselves are the products of something, and the things they are the products of are, I believe, the things which are to be used to give an explanation of behavior. I am a thoroughgoing radical behaviorist in the sense that I deny the efficacy of states of mind, feelings, purposes, intentions, and so on. I don't believe the, the issue hinges on that, but I believe the essential creativity of, of a person, as possibly explained in terms of consequences, is important. You have been listening to one in a series of programs recorded during a conference held to discuss with Professor B. F. Skinner the theories presented in his book Beyond Freedom and Dignity. This program originated at the Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions in Santa Barbara. Thank you.